Real Talk is proudly sponsored by Huawei P20 Pro and MTN. Good evening and welcome to Real Talk with me, Azania Mosaka. With a career spanning two decades, my guest list of achievements is nothing short of impressive. Have a listen to this. 23 awards to his name, including eight summers, 21 studio albums that have led to more than 36 hit songs and four DVDs. That's massive. Well, with these kinds of numbers, it's no wonder he is considered the undisputed prince of Afrikaans dancehall music. He's the gentleman who carries his success with modesty and pride. So please welcome onto the show, singer-songwriter Kurt Darren. Thank you. Thanks Who's for a nice introduction. Who it? Dit gaat baie goed. Hoe lang is hier die program? Een uh, uur. Ek moet net weet, I just want to just know how long I'm going to keep my stomach. <laughs> you pulling it in? Yeah, I'm okay. okay. Well, there's so much to catch up with you on. Welcome home, firstly. Thank you so much. You have been living in Cape Town for three years. I was a tourist for three years. Oh, wow. No, no, I'm just saying, I mean, in Cape Town, I mean, my work is basically up here. I do some shows in Cape Town and it's yeah. beautiful. I love Cape Town, I love the Cape Town people, I love the Capetonians. Mm -hmm. But when I got back home, I used to have, you know, we used to go to the Winelands all the time, my wife and I and the kids, and that's what we did. So I was a tourist for three years. Wow. Being back here, I feel the buzz. I'm hungry to be creative again. I'm mm. hungry for just to meet new people. That's awesome. That's awesome. But welcome back. And Thank I'm surprised you. that you say that uh, because it does have a strong Afrikaans community. And like you said, this is for business. Joburg is the center of where business is humming, especially in the music business. It really is where the buzz is. Not, not that Cape Town doesn't have a buzz. It's got an amazing buzz. But you feel like kind of relaxed in Cape Town. <laughs> a little bit too laid back. And I'm like that, you know, whether I'm on a cruise or on a holiday, over on a beach somewhere, I always want to be active and doing something. My wife knows me like that. So... I was falling asleep a bit. Oh, wow. So um, I just had to come back and just get onto that buzz again. Yeah. So you have two little children, yeah. three-year-old and a year and a half. Yeah. Your house must be crazy. It's amazingly crazy. Yeah. She started riding bicycle today, uh, Kara, the little girl. Mm -hmm. And the little boy is just, these expressions are just, you know, you just want to go home and see him smile. Oh, man. So I'm loving it, you know. I didn't know that uh, parenthood would do that to me. Yeah. But it's taught me to be calmer, to be um, just more patient with people, I suppose. Mm. And your wife, how did you guys meet? Very cheesy, eh? Really? 14 years ago, music video, <laughs> shot at my house. She's one of five models, and she's the one I saw immediately, and I went to the director and I said, make sure she's in every scene. That she's the love interest in the story. Make sure. And then I asked her the next night, to go on a date. I found a number. I, I got a number from the agent. And she said, no. <gasps> really? Mm. How did that feel? I'm sure you don't get turned down. Broke my heart, man. Broke my heart. Yeah. 14 years ago, that didn't happen. Didn't happen. So I think that's why it stuck like glue. Yes, because you finally got the girl. Yeah. Fantastic. Finally got the girl. I had to work for it. Mm, yeah. And I got a quality girl. You know, in our business, um, getting someone that really understands this business is... Uh, now it's quite an effort, you know? Yes, I mean, musicians do talk about that. The long hours, it's very different, you know, the challenges yeah. that musicians face uh, because you work long hours. Sometimes the income is unpredictable, but you need someone there that's just going to always... That's it. That you know, life, I mean, people must realize we're also just normal human beings, you and sure. I. You're a bit more than normal. <laughs> but, but sometimes we have to, you know, just before you go on stage... If there's something that's irking you, that's that's just like, and you got that someone there just to say hi, Leafy, and then Leafy's like giving you all the Leafy, moral support. Say for me as a belief, my aura like me to slap. This is that you look at camera, baby. Okay. <laughs> no, nah, she's very cool and she's so supportive, and she's got a master in psychology, so she um I, I get away with nothing, mm -hmm. nothing. I can't tell little white lies or nothing. Not that I would. Yes. I get away with nothing. Uh oh. She's a very clever. I can girl. see right through you. Mm. So, you recently recorded, well, not recently, it's just come out, the song that you did with Claire Johnston. Mm. Um, you recorded it two years ago. Why the long wait? 
We recorded two years ago. They phoned me two years ago and went in and it was great and it was amazing and Claire was there. It was so nice to have Claire in the studio with the producer and John and everyone while I was recording the song and her voice was already on and then we worked out some harmonies and it was actually quite a quick process. And then we shot the video about probably about a year later, yeah. a year and a half later. And um, I don't know. I don't know why it took so long, but I, I know that my, my CDs were out at the same time and probably record company didn't want something interfering with the singles that I had out kind of thing. Yes. So I know they did ask last year, can they release? And they asked just to wait a bit to give my CD a bit of a chance. And it's just great that it's out there now. You know, I think singing with her and the way our voices blend is amazing. And she's such an awesome woman. If you see she her, she is. I know. Her. I've interviewed her before. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, but the two coming together was it easy? Because she's known for uh, the pop, almost like Afro pop sound. And then of course you do Afrikaans music. I do everything. You must remember, you know, music is a universal language. I'm yeah. thinking. Uh, I've had English number ones as well. Standing on the edge was number one on High Felt and KFM and all the things. So, um, yes, I'm primarily an Afrikaans singer and I've got a big passion for Afrikaans music and the language and the way you can tell stories in the language. Mm -hmm. But I primarily sing, I mean, I sing everything. I'm a fan of a whole lot of different kinds of music. I've been a fan of Mango Groove for many years. Yes, I think so a lot of us grew up loving them. Yeah, and I mean, if you can feel that beat, it doesn't matter what beat that language is in. Mm -hmm. You know, I get people of all, all kinds of people come to my shows <laughs> because they just know it's fun. There's no animosity and there's no hidden messages and all that kind of stuff. It's just come a and have time some out. fun. Yeah, it's a good time out. And um, yeah, I have a jewel in the industry. It's what I've been doing for so many years. Absolutely. I just put smiles on people's faces. Yeah, but congratulations are in order. It's remiss of me not even to have mentioned it earlier on because you got another summer and yeah. what, your 23rd award. That is staggering. So yeah. how does the 23rd one feel compared to when you got your first one? Does it still Well, I've got eight Summers. Eight Summers, yeah. And I've got 20... Uh, Overall uh, awards. Or something uh, yeah, in, in total, you know, Gumas and all these kind of things. Yeah. But eight Summers, to have eight Summers in, in this industry is amazing, you know, and it felt like the first one, to be honest with you. Really? And when they called my name out, my last summer was in 2000, and I'm always nominated somehow, but very, I'm very blessed, but... Uh, my last song, I think, was about six years ago. Mm -hmm. So to get this song again for Best of Pop, and I want to be in Best of Pop. You know, everyone says, oh, pop music, pop music. It's so artificial and so, uh, you know. They're quick to diss pop. People are quick to diss but pop. But why? Yeah. Tell me, when you go to a party, the first song you put on, well, what do you put on? You put on a pop song. You put to on get song, the vibe going. Get the vibe going, you know. And I've sung ballads. I've sung kind of pop songs. I've sung everything. You know? mm -hmm. and I just love music. So if I hear anything with a good melody, if you ask me what kind of music do I really love, I'll tell you anything with a great melody, anything that just gets me going. You so know, you listen to everything as well. Your, your, if we had to listen to your iPod mm. or the top five songs you're listening to at the moment, what would they be? You'll find my Fiki Zola on there. Yeah. With their greatest hits. I just love them. They know that. I mean, we've done so many corporates. Actually, uh, Claire and I did a corporate with them at Sun City, uh, a couple of other singers. And watching their live act, to me, they're the best live act in the world wow. i love them yeah i don't know why they're not at this big concert that's coming up but they are uh, uh, the most amazing live act to me mm -hmm. i've watched live acts all over the world and i've watched everyone and i've been on some of those shows but watching my fikis all alive to me is such a treat that's a great compliment just the way the backup dancers move with them and everything's just in flow mm -hmm. it's like a well-rehearsed racehorse <laughs> <laughs> after all these years it's a great yeah that's no, just it's just amazing to watch, and I love watching that kind of talent. Yes. Yeah. So you're on a, a sort of a lifestyle plan, a change of lifestyle plan. Hmm. You've been... A wellness plan. Wellness plan. Yes. Is that the way to put it? What yeah. does that entail? What's the goal? No, I just think, you know, I've always had anyone that's kind of tall, I'm kind of tall, um, would have suffered from lower back problems sometime in their life. And, sure. And I've, sure. I've suffered for, for many years of lower back problems. And, um, you know, I just decided, uh, let's do something about it. Let's strengthen my core, strengthen my back muscles, and be a better me and be the best me that I can and the best father to my kids and the best husband to my wife. And I want to carry on in this industry for a long time. I've still mm -hmm. got a lot of songs in my head, a lot of melodies. So I decided, let's do this 12-week plan. It's with a company called Kaizen Wellness. Yeah. What this guy does, he gets up every morning at Hard of Beer Sport, drives an hour to me where I stay in Centurion, and trains me at 5 o'clock in the morning. Jeez. So it's for the next 12 weeks, it's going to be like that. And also, I mean, you guys had lasagna for me tonight. <laughs> you guys had lasagna downstairs here. 
I just sat <laughs> looking <laughs> at the lasagna, looking at the sodas. I said, I can't do it. You can't. Give me a bottle of water, please. Yeah. It's not it's not a diet thing, it's a it's a wellness thing. I want an over I want to feel great. So you're feeling good? Well, it's only been a couple of days. But I'm feeling great. Okay. I'm as long as you're not great. grumpy, because when you start taking away the carbs and the sugar, people get really on edge. No, it's not just about no, no, you eat carbs and this thing. It's a great, it's a great it's, it's a great thing to be on. Mm -hmm. But I'm just stiff. I'm a little bit stiff sitting right here. Right. Yeah. I Drimming saw you coming up here to take your seat. Yeah, I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm just a little bit stiff, but um, I'll get used to it. Give me three weeks. <laughs> and in 12 weeks, we'll talk again. I'll send you a little video in 12 weeks. Sure, you. and you're going to flash a six pack. Anyway, I'm not going to hold you to it. I'm not going to hold you to it. But you're already working on a new album. Uh, I mean, your recent album was what, in October? Mm. And here you are with more music. Like, where's the, so where's the inspiration coming from? I mean, you already said that you've got a lot of melodies. Is it every day? Does it come from anywhere, anytime? Inspiration can come at any time. You could be at the airport. You could be sitting, um, you could be sitting um, at the back of the set at, at Real Talk. Yeah. You could be anywhere. And something could happen that triggers something and goes, it's a great idea for a song. So I'm always working on new songs. Mm -hmm. We start writing tomorrow on a, on a, on a new summer song because for many years I was known as the guy that brings out that summer hit for the beaches. And we're working on one for the end of the year and um, we'll see. We won't release an album again this year because that's a bit too soon. We'll release it next year. But mm -hmm. we're definitely going to release a single in about 12 weeks time. Coming back to Gauteng is certainly doing wonders. That oh, is incredible. Yeah. Look at that. More music coming your way. Well, speaking of new, I'm in the mood to take up a new skill. So how do you feel about teaching me how to do the soki? If my wife heard you ask me to teach you how to soki, she'd laugh. She'd really? She's got two left feet. I think I can soki, but I'm going to teach you one of my moves. Okay. Okay. It's okay. a deal. It's a deal. I've got two left feet, so I'm looking forward to that. Please don't laugh too hard when we do it later. <laughs> he may be the prince of Afrikaans dance music today, but years ago, Kurt Darren was uh, involved himself in many things before music. We'll talk about some of that after the break. From a good old traditional soki to an upbeat dance hit, you, Kurt, are the go-to guy when it comes to Afrikaans music. But before Kurt Darren teaches me how to soki, there's a lot more to talk about, especially his stint in the army. He worked at the Kruger National Park and he joined the family construction business. So let's get straight into it. Mm. You were not born Kurt Darren, you're a Van Heerden. Mm. So where did the stage name come from? Many, many years ago, I think my first TV appearance ever was in... Uh, I'm going to get the date right, I think 1992 or 1993, something like that. It was a program called Punchline with a yeah. whole lot of comedians. And a, the, a gentleman in our industry called Lance James, he's an absolute gentleman, took me up. I went to actually, I, I sang Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Me, uh, is that right? Yeah? From Elton John to yeah. him live and he took me, he said, immediately phoned Cyril Green and said, this guy's got to be seen on TV. And I went to my first show and in the lift on the way up, he said, yes, but Kurt van Heeren, I don't know how well that's going to work in this industry. <laughs> mm, you should be a country singer, my boy. I don't, I don't know how well it's going to work. And he said, let's change your name. What about Kurt Darren? Just for this interview, try it, Kurt Darren. Just like that. And I did it. Yeah. And it stuck. Mm. So I don't mind. I still fully my official thing is Kurt van Heeren, but everyone knows me as Kurt Darren. Yes. Yeah. It's not that I'm embarrassed about the surname. It's just it worked out Kurt Darren. Yeah. yeah. Wow. It's quite interesting. But you were born into what your father's Afrikaans, what your mother's English. Mm. So what was that upbringing like, having to look at or, or be part of both cultures? I've always felt I'm part of all cultures. It's the weird thing. We grew up very free-spirited. Mm -hmm. um, my mother's from Zimbabwe, and my parents, believe it or not, were actually hippies right in the beginning, yeah. before we were born. They were hippies. So they're very free-spirited people. So I think our family was brought up great, great values. I think um, we learned to be gentlemen through my gran and 
and my family. I've, I've, got a, I've got an amazing family, and they've kept my feet on the ground all the years. But I don't think being Afrikaans and English kind of had an effect on anything. Just I think it broadens your horizons mm -hmm. more than anything else. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to know that you are South African. So there were no tensions between, especially when you think of the history, because there are some people who would carry that animosity towards the English because of what happened and vice versa. Well, it's weird. I was in an English school and I had lots of Afrikaans friends in the school next door. Yeah. And there was that English Afrikaans thing, you know, that, that kind of thing. And we all, we, 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 found it, we found it like amusing kind of thing because most of our friends were in that school. And I had obviously all my, my, my the, the pupils that I knew in, in my school. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I didn't really feel anything like that. We never really made friends based on whether you're English or Afrikaans or what color you are. Yeah. We, just, we were just like, we grew up like that, you know. Right. We, we grew up very free. And then you were in the army. Mm. What led you to the army? They forced me to go to the army. Yes, because it was during the 80s when con, there was, was conscription. conscription. And I was the last intake. Mm -hmm. I was 80, 89. I was the last intake to, be, to have to go to the army, you know. And I'll never forget it. I ended up in Volfus Bay, of all mm -hmm. places. That's mm -hmm. where I start my, start my service. So I ended up in Volfus Bay and I absolutely, I just didn't like it. You know, I'm just not into that. And um, eventually they changed to one year. And we were in for two years, so they, they made me do one and a half years. Mm -hmm. And that was it? So they left me with six months just doing nothing. So I hiked down to Cape Town. I uh, went to go visit my brother who was doing uh, um, his um, fuck monks cup there, which he was doing plumbing. Mm -hmm. And I just made a lot of friends. I started singing about a gospel as well down while I was down there. Really? You had a family. gospel chapter? Yeah. Yeah, I started to be a pastor at a stage of mm -hmm. my life at Rayma. What made you walk away from that? Oh, different thing. Was this yeah. once the music career had started? Uh, kind of during it, yeah. Not the Macy Macy part, but before that. Yes, yes, while you're doing the English album. I think you're still trying to discover yourself. When you're young, you, you kind of, everyone's got ideas for how your life's going to be. And mm. uh, some people wanted me to be a doctor because I loved animals and I loved looking after people. But some people wanted me to be an accountant because of numbers and things like that. I don't know what I want to do. I, know, I just know that I read from a very early age. So I, that's why I broadened my horizons. I've, I've been reading since I was mm -hmm. primary school. Mm -hmm. So I've been writing for a long time, whether it be poems and essays, it eventually turned into songs, which I was just supposed to be there one day. And I, you know, at, at that age, you don't really know what you want to do. Yeah, were well you seeking? Because I wonder like when, when someone considers going into the ministry, you know, what it is that they are looking to have their lives encapsulate. Yeah, I um, I can't really broaden on that. I don't know why it didn't work out or anything like yeah. that. But I just, my life just went in another direction. Yeah. Not a bad direction, just went in another direction. And is that the Kruger National Park? Kruger National Park, I was just a guide that kind of took groups out there and things like that. They didn't work out too well because I was there for about, well, four months. And I had to take like, tour buses there of Taiwanese air hostesses. And when they found out I sing, you've got this bus <laughs> with 60 Taiwanese air hostesses. <laughs> then you sing. Uh, uh, you, they start playing um, um, rock, paper, scissors with you. And you either got to sing or take an item of clothing off. Oh. So you chose to sing. I sang my heart out. Yeah, it's right. I sang my heart out. Then I realized, okay, let's get out of this. No construction for you. My whole family was in the construction business. So no construction for you, nothing. You're going to be a singer. Just accept it. And let's start seeing if you can start writing your own songs. I never believed that I could write my own songs. Was it hard to get in the music business? We know how you got For the sure. name Kurt Darren, but you know, people talk, people are always trying to be spotted because it's just so competitive. 100%. I went through everything. I was going to stage, dye my hair blue, Ooh. or <clears throat> wear spikes up in my head just so people can remember what you looked like. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I was thinking about everything. But eventually, you realize. It's a song. Mm -hmm. It's a song that can spark things, and the trick is to stay there. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to get there, but it's so hard to stay there. And once you you kind of got people's trust, and then now you've got discipline in what you're doing, and it's not just a hobby for you. It's something that you're actually taking very seriously, and you've got passion for it. I love music so much, and I love writing and performing. Uh, once they see that, I think you've got their trust, and as long as you don't let them down, you can carry on for years. Yeah, so that's been part of what's ensured your longevity over the years. You won't find me late for a meeting. You won't find me um, doing uh, unnecessary things 
backstage or after a show, hanging out in a pub till four o'clock in the morning and stuff like that. Yeah. You've got to have your little, you've got to have some discipline in this business to really succeed. And, and it's each to his own. I mean, everyone's got different personalities, but that's just been my personality over the years. Mm, and it's paid off. Yeah. So you started off producing and making music in English, and then you branched off into making music in Afrikaans. And that's really where your success grew more than before. Um, so what is the key? Why do you think there was a difference in those periods? Well, once again, I didn't quite know what I was doing. I just know I wanted to sing. Yeah. To make music. And at that time, the only Afrikaans music out there was the... Um, bicycle Son of the Slot on Chris Combase and the Bless Bridges stuff and Steve I remember that, yeah. and all these different guys and I, I wanted something else I wanted a more of a pop thing mm -hmm. I just knew that I wanted this melody that just you know um, nothing wrong with the music and it's amazing but I wanted this pop thing so I, I eventually started realizing I have to do this myself and I found two guys Chris Ifanikak and Aaron Sklainans that through the years uh, with my record company, we've written all those songs. Whether it be Captain, Himmel op Tafelberg, Voorwaarts um, Maas, anything that you, can, that you can mention. We wrote all those songs, mm -hmm. and we've actually just made such a great team. So once you've found that, mm. and that starts working, you get the right producer, then you're okay. Yes, then once you create the track record, you know you can play the areas where you can play and experiment a little bit. Yes, you, you have for a reason, eh? <laughs> but what's the essence? What, what is the essence with Afrikaans music? How would you describe it? Um, I think it's uncomplicated, the kind of music I make. I think it's uncomplicated. I think it's the kind of music you can sit in traffic and listen and go, oh, it's a friendly, that's a nice melody. That's just something so, so catchy. And if you go to the festivals, the Afrikaans music festivals, like any boss, like um, Super Naviak in, uh, in uh, Blythdale. Mm. Um, you go to all these great festivals, you'll start seeing that it's everyone's friendly. And this English Afrikaans, it doesn't matter who you are. They're all there. And they're just loving the vibe because the whole vibe from the concert goes and everything's just so friendly. And the loyalty? Why do you think? It's amazing. Yeah. The loyalty is amazing. I think we're one of the last kind of genres to still have CDs out there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's also disappearing. It's mm -hmm. taking over. But I think we're the, kind of the last genres that really want their CD signed. And they stay in. They stay in a queue for an hour and a half, two hours after the show. To concert, you're standing and you're signing CDs, you're signing arms. Wow. And um, it's just a very loyal market, you know. And it's amazing to be part of that market. And, and for those people that have grown with you and for you to have grown with them. Mm. Wow, I know the, the loyalty is, is unsurpassed. That's crazy. And even though it may be seen as a small market, uh, when you look at the numbers, when you look at the longevity that the artists have and the depth of loyalty, I think there's a lot to be said for that. Yeah. Mm. Right, so, so more with Kurt Darren after the break as we explore more on his musical rise. the kind of moves he'll be teaching me later. He'll be teaching me good old Soki. Well, to his fans, Coach Darren is affectionately, affectionately known, rather, as the Big KD, and he is my guest tonight. So when people talk about highlights of their career, I'm pretty sure for Coach Darren that he remembers quite clearly the honor of watching bands like Queen, Amy Winehouse, Vusi Matlatsela, and Will Smith at Nelson Mandela's 90th birthday. So there you were on the lineup, and enjoying Queen, led by F Freddie Mercury, one of the most unbelievable artists of our lifetime, alongside Amy Winehouse. That's well, crazy. Freddie wasn't there, unfortunately. Ah. Freddie really passed away. But ah. I, I was watching Queen and uh, Amy. Amy Winehouse, I mean, um, she actually took my slot. I was going to do Standing on the Edge, and I ended up singing a song with Eddie Grant, which is fine. Because she came out of rehab and they said, we need to open a slot. <laughs> this is now in London after you've been there for two weeks rehearsing. Yes. And Amy's come out of rehab. Um, Kurt, do you mind? You know, it's We have to make this. She said, no problem. So they took one song from me and one song from someone else. Mm -hmm. And 
I eventually ended up watching Queen performing, and then I felt like this little hand, this little arm on my shoulder. I looked back, <laughs> and it's Amy Winehouse. She's looking at me watching Queen. I'm like, hi. Yeah, you know, and Lewis Hamilton over there. And oh, wow. Yeah, you know, and Annie Lennox and whatever. But the highlight of the whole time was actually spending one-on-one -on -one time with Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget this, you know. Uh, it was before the time. He asked to meet me before the time. I met him. I saw him there as well, but I met him at his home here and in, uh, in Joburg. And um, I remember giving him his silk cufflinks. I mean, I don't know what I'm going to meet. What, yes, what you're presenting with. This, this, yeah. Mm -hmm. And... It was nice, and Zelda, Zelda Lachanji organized it for me, and uh, he wanted to meet me, and I sat down with him, and I sat next to him, and he presented me with this beautiful book. He had these massive books that he reserves for, I don't know, but it's like a huge book, and he signed it to my friend, Kurt Dane. And then later on, in a very important birthday, my wife actually made an, had an oil painting made of that moment and gave it to me on my birthday, oh. and he signed. So it's, yeah, it's just amazing. The whole experience was great. So here we are celebrating the centenary of Nelson Mandela's birth. And this is the very week, in fact. Uh, so it's nice that you can reflect on something so precious. It is precious. I'll always remember it. You know? mm. I wish it was still with us. Yeah, mm. yeah. So one of the highlights as well must be having performed at the inauguration of former president Jacob Zuma. A highlight for a different reason. Now, you're going, now you're going to the other end of the, the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum, that's yeah. it. Because... Did you, firstly, when you got the call, did you agree immediately? Well, I was representing um, a culture. Mm -hmm. You know, they asked me to come and sing Captain, and they asked me to sing s songs with, uh, I think it was with Rebecca. My Lord, if I'm, I'm, I can't remember who, uh, Yvonne, Yvonne Chaka Chaka. Mm -hmm. And um, I just, I agreed, of course I'm going to agree, um, as a South African, not for another reason. Yes. So, yeah, people will say, yeah, we can look back and regret that now. It was Jacob Zuma or whatever. But I'm like, you know what? Uh, um, life throws you these little things and, and uh, you've got, you got to either handle it or go and sit in a corner kind of thing. And I did it and I got a lot of criticism. Yes. But you had um, right wing groups. Yeah, but it doesn't matter. You know, everyone's, everyone's got a, uh, um, a right to voice their own opinions. But when they started attacking my family, mm. like on social media and stuff, that really killed me. Because I feel as a South African, I've also got a voice and my voice, my voice should be heard, you know. And I'm not an offensive guy and I, I'm not going to come out and make any speeches and all that kind of stuff. But I still want to represent mm -hmm. my culture, which is I'm, I'm a South African. I speak Afrikaans, and I speak English, but I'm a South African, you know. And um, it was great being there. And it was great just being part of that. How it ended up wasn't great. And how it ended up and up and up over yes. a few years wasn't great either. But, um, you know, I did my, I did my part. Because the irony is that even, even the ANC Youth League came to your defense. There was even a hashtag, hands off Kurt. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's funny. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I just know I've, I've, I've got a lot of friends in, in South Africa. And, I, you know, things like that just don't, don't bug me. Mm -hmm. They just don't bug me. You know, I wrote a letter, I wrote an open letter to everyone just saying, um, stating my thing. It was a very, very long letter. And there were over 300,000 responses to it from people that just want to just move forward. Yeah. And the we living in South Africa, just chill and get on with it and have a great time. You know, this is an amazing country. I've been all over the world. I've, s I've spent time with different cultures, whether it be Australia or Canada or whatever. And I'm not a politician. I'm a musician. But um, we're all human beings. So it must have pained you, as you say, you're not a politician, you're a musician. And yet the role that you played then was politicized in that way for people's different agendas and ends. Yeah, very much. But you must remember, my work is on a very public platform. So right. people are going to make different issues about different things all the time, you know. Mm -hmm. So Where you take it with, you have it to. comes with the business. You have to, you know. And the way you handle that um, will write your little path forward. And I don't think you can change a person. I think... I think you are what you are, and I've always been a very open book, and I'm, I'm, you know, you can't really change me. I, I, I just believe in, in people. I believe in the human spirit. You know, you had a lady on a couple of episodes ago with a, with a tuberculosis. Yeah, yeah. And that was amazing, you know. I mean, just hearing her story, 
um, was amazing to me. And I love the human spirit. And I love people overcoming obstacles like what happened to me at the inauguration or whatever. Mm -hmm. it's not, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't focus on negative things. I've always been a positive person. Yeah. It's the weirdest thing. Like I'll, I, I thought about it the other day. I ran into someone the other day and I, and I greeted them and it was, hi you my friend and hi you this. And then about a week later, I realized that that guy had actually done me in with a lot of money. Years before. Years before. And I actually realized, I thought, oh, he must think I'm mad. <laughs> You must think I'm mad. I think you're me. mad. Because I forget about stuff like that. Yeah. It doesn't focus. I focus on the positive things. I really do. Mm. And I forget about negative people. Negative people don't influence me. Okay. Never Let's have. come back to the music then. Because you've had lots of hits. I'm sure the songs that you have to have to sing, like Macy Macy. Is it still part of your re repertoire? Macy Macy, I'll sing every now and then. Okay. I still and sing Captain? it every now and then. Captain, I have to sing on every show. If I leave it out of the show, you get letters afterwards, you get on social media, they go, really? On your Facebook page. We How paid could so much you money, we waited so long for you to sing. You come here, don't sing Captain. I think it's a cheat. <laughs> and then every now and then, or when I want to try a ballad at a song, a song like Los Lapi as well, Indie Humber now as well, mm -hmm, Kabiki, mm -hmm. that I did of my Fiki Zolo, people want me to sing that song. But when I try and do a ballad at a show, it's very, very funny because. The kids, I've got a nice kids audience. And the kids, they're all sitting in front and they, and they see Wim Kurt, the Captain guy and the Low Sloppy guy. And suddenly I'm singing. A ballad, love song. Standing on the edge of my life. And you're you singing that and they're going. <laughs> yeah, they go, what, oat. <laughs> it's, like, it's oat. <laughs> yeah. But it's not that. I just love, I love music. I love ballads. Yeah. yeah. And then it's gone on, like your music has gone on to be re-recorded in different languages. Mm -hmm. I mean. The popularity in places like Germany and parts of Europe. Can yeah. you believe that success? I go over about three or four times a year. Holland, Germany, Belgium. Um, because they've recorded at least that we know of 35 of my tracks Jeez. that we've written. That they've recorded over there. Big artists. So you're the David, David Hasselhoff. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> of Afrikaans music. Stop it. No. <laughs> he wouldn't say. So I go and sing there every now and then and they... And they treat me like gold. It's amazing. I do. I do these street festivals. South Africa's David Hasselhoff. I'm not South Africa's David Hasselhoff. And I go over there and I just have fun with these guys. You know, the Dutch language is like Afrikaans, like turned around. Yes. Kind of and we, it's actually, um, it's just part of my career. That's just added a fun element. I've been doing it for about eight years now. That I've been going over there. And when I go over there, they actually ha they bring in a radio station, one of the biggest radio stations in Holland. And they asked me to record like a Dutch song, and the radio station will have a six to nine with with Kurt Darren in the studio kind of thing, and it's like a live thing. So they make a big thing of it, and it's fun mm -hmm. every now and then to go over there. I don't think South Africans really know what I do on that side, but yeah. I'm having fun, and I'll, it's nice to get back here and sing to our guys again. Absolutely. Well, there's still so much more to explore. You're up to so much. You're busy, not just the lifestyle wellness thing. You're also busy with a couple of projects which we'll be exploring after the break. But also what we'll be talking about was a day that gave Kurt and his family the kind of scare that had him worried for his life. We're gonna talk about being forced to take a break from the music business next. Wow, that's a song dedicated to his late dad. Tonight, we're sitting down with Kurt Darren. A night of harmless fun with friends started off on a celebratory mood, but no one could have ever guessed it would end up with him being airlifted to Mill Park Hospital. I'm talking about July 2013, where Kurt and his friends had gone out to watch a rugby match, and then when they were driving back, the unimaginable happened. Sure, do you recall the events of that evening? quite vividly, are they still very alive to you, the memories of that day? I don't know. I suppose I could see it going through my head again. Yeah? I don't know. What I do recall is that I was doing my helicopter license at that time and I had all my hours, I had 64 hours. Wow. 
I'd written all my exams. I only had um, um, meteorology left. I'd done, I'd done air law and human performance and everything. And I was writing my final exam on the Monday. Mm -hmm. The Saturday I had the accident and because of the resulting injuries that, that kind of happened to me, I, I'm not allowed to fly helicopters anymore. Oh no, you got that far. I've been doing yeah. my private pilot's license Yeah. and I know the hours, so I know, know the dedication. Takes. Absolutely. Yeah. And you ha did you have to give that up? Yeah, I got no peripheral vision. So I broke 11 ribs. I, yes. had, I had this big car accident and whatever. Everyone knew. So I broke 11 ribs. And I had a sixth nerve palsy. So there was a bone broken in the middle of my, somewhere near the base of my brain mm. and a cut off my nerve to my eye. So for two years I wore a patch and dark yes. glasses and everything. And then I had, um, it didn't want to come right. So they said, said the sixth nerve was cut off. So they moved this muscle over here to this side. Mm -hmm. So now I can see perfectly and everything. I, I saw double for two years. That's uncomfortable. I saw double. So you'd be sitting there and there. Yes. So I saw double for two years. And uh, they operated, and uh, I just don't have peripheral vision, so I can't look left. Mm. I have to turn my head and look left, mm. which is fine, but you don't want to fly in a helicopter with me if I can't see what's happening on the ground. Yeah, so you had to give that up. Yeah, but it's fine. I'm, I'm alive. You're alive. I'm healthy, and my kids were there afterwards, and I'm, yeah, I've just got a great life. So. so what do you remember? Do you remember being airlifted or do you, like waking up in hospital and thinking, what happened? No, I knew, I mean, it's a car that came into our lane. I wasn't even driving, I was a passenger. I remember yeah. they, it took about three and a half hours to cut me out. And I was stuck under my seat. And I remember people bending it back and then opening this thing up like a tin can. Mm -hmm. And then um, hoisting me up on the gurney, 11 meters up onto the main road, then driving an ambulance to the, to the uh, um, where helicopter was waiting, and then flying. And then all I remember, it doesn't sound very weird, mm -hmm. When you're an artist and you're a public figure, you kind of, you kind of become a very private person. Yeah. And all I remember, and all these guys are doing is trying to save my life or trying to see you know, happy, happy internal injuries and whatever. And I remember them cutting off all my clothes <laughs> from the top. <laughs> you're like, no. From my jeans, my favorite jeans, my favorite jeans, my favorite jacket, my favorite shirt. I had everything on that night, and they cut everything. And I remember my jeans. I had this beautiful G-Star jacket and it just exploded. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm lying there. And I just remember saying to the doctor, I, I can't remember how, because I couldn't really talk. And I just made my finger and said, just cover me at least. <laughs> <laughs> my dignity, please. And I remember putting like a lumpy, uh, well, a, a huge cloth. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I remember putting that, just, just covering me up. <laughs> and uh, that's what I remember from that night. <laughs> and then obviously my wife was overseas. Oh, she was in, she was in Croatia with, for her 30th birthday. And... Um, so she didn't know about it mm. at all. Mm. And then about, she was on the cruise, so there, was, so there was no, she didn't have WhatsApp or anything. And she got to the island, some island in Croatia, sat at a coffee shop. This is like probably 12 hours after it happened. Mm -hmm. And she knows, no, she knows nothing. And she's sitting at this coffee shop with her mother and her aunt. And she puts on her phone, gets Wi-Fi, and suddenly her phone just goes, dun, 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 dun. And every message is like, Praying for you. She wish him the best. The worst. And she's like, what has Kurt done? Every time I leave him alone, he does something like this. <laughs> so she came home, oh, shame, three flights later. So what was your worry, though? What was your biggest concern regarding your, your, your wife? Uh, and of course, yes, you, what, you hadn't had your, your, your children yet. No, I hadn't yet, had my children yet. But no. just knowing that she's going to see you this way, that you almost lost your life. Yeah, it was a weird experience. I didn't quite know how to handle it. Until yeah. that time in my life, I'd never broken a bone in my body. So suddenly to be lying there with 11 broken ribs, mm -hmm. and this somehow, I didn't know my eye was like looking into that direction over there. I, I didn't know anything. And, and I mean, I got so many visitors and so many awesome people out there that just came to support me. Like schools from Rustenburg, like, like creches. Well, not creches, what do you call them? Uh, nursery schools. Mm -hmm. And then they're driving a bus. The teacher, teachers were driving on a bus like, 15 kids and they come here with teddy bears, oh. leave it outside my room and whatever. Yeah, and That's ironically, precious. they put me in in the same room that Nelson Mandela was in. At Mill Park. At, at Mill Park, yeah. Wow. And they just looked after me so well. You know, they just, they just, they were so caring. I, I've, I've never thanked them enough, mm -hmm. the Milk Park personnel, and maybe this is my chance. They do so much. I mean, there were so many people coming in after me, people that were even worse injured than me or whatever. And these people just, they just give you their time. Mm -hmm. 
So how did, what did it do to your perspective on living life? Did it alter it in any way? Did it change your outlook? I, look, I've always been a positive person. I've always been, uh, nothing will get me down kind of thing. I know some, uh, some magazine, some national magazine offered me huge money for a photo of me in my hospital bed. <laughs> Bruised and silly, sorry broken for bones. Broken bones and everything. Hopefully and you were covered this time. I you just had a lappy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I just refused because I, you, you don't want to, uh, I don't want to be seen in, in a weakness kind of thing. I know it's reality. You're injured and everything, but I didn't want that, you know, mm. especially for the kids. I've got such a big kids market. So while we were lying in my bed, in my hospital bed, the same two guys came there, Alan and Quincy, and we wrote Sea Rover, which became an album. So Sea Rover is pirate, for those of you that don't know. So yes. pirate wears a patch. So they told me I'm going to have to wear a patch for quite a long time. So I wrote this song called Sea Rover, because I knew I'm going to have to take a video with a patch on anyway, mm -hmm. just that the kids outside there would be cool, but um, Captain is now a seer over. And they wouldn't be scared, or they wouldn't be like, oh, you know, what's happened to him? Kind right. Of. So, you've got to turn the negatives into positives, and I kind of, that's what I want to do with my life. You know? But also, you had to change your schedule, but in that time, a lot of artists volunteered to do your shows for you, mm -hmm. uh, because your calendar was packed up, chock-a-block, and there you were lying in hospital. How did that make you feel? Yeah, it's amazing. The camaraderie, when you get to a in a situation like that, the camaraderie is, is hard to explain. It's amazing, you know. It's um, I've always had loyalty like that. Mm -hmm. So it was awesome for my friends also to have loyalty like that. And there were a lot of artists that they came to visit me and offered to do my shows mm -hmm. and uh, and whatever, you know. Um, so yeah, it was just an amazing, it was an amazing time. So I think you, in you, when you look at look at your situation again, you get a second lease on life. And you're going to do the most of your life that you can. You've been doing great till then, but you're really going to live your life. But did you ever have doubts, though? Because here you are, your eye is impacted. There's no guarantee that you'll have your eyesight back. Um, and you now have to wear a patch. Was there ever a time when you were scared about your career, losing your career in the way that you'd come to know it? I don't think so. I did Scospa, which is a massive show at Sun City, in October that year. Mm -hmm. This was in July. So in October, it was like one of my first shows back. My first show was for Nelson Mandela's um, anniversary at uh, Ellis Park. Yeah. That was my first show back. But my my first big was Scospell at Sun City. And I'll never forget, I had to wear a patch. Mm -hmm. And I came on to sing. And at Scospell, there was an 88-piece orchestra that played at Scospell. And I came on to sing, I can't remember what song it was. And I walked onto stage and the whole orchestra stood up and put eye patches in, <gasps> in front of five and a half thousand people. Was that a surprise for you? Yeah, completely. No, I never expected it. And the whole orchestra put eye patches on. And in moments like that, you realize there is human empathy. Mm. You forget about all this negative stuff you read in, in the headlines every day and just this- I would have cried, that's incredible. Yeah, it's, it's crazy, you know, and my life's been full of moments like that, like really special moments, because I, I think I surround myself with special people. But it's also in how you treat them. Yeah, I hope so. I People hope don't just do that out of nowhere. It's in how you treat them as well. Oh. Hmm. Well, Kurt, uh, we're glad you're here today. Thank you. <laughs> All together. We're glad you're Almost. here today. Well, coming up next, I did say that I want to learn how to soak you. So let's see what Kurt can teach me after this. <laughs> Nervous. <laughs> So we're about to find out if indeed I do have two left feet, which I believe I do. Kurt Darren, who's been my guest tonight, is about to show me a couple of his moves so that I can be decent on the dance floor. But before we get to that, Kurt, you're busy with a couple of projects at the moment. You've mentioned kids throughout this conversation. Mm. And you're busy with a kids' cruise, right? Busy with a kids' cruise. We're doing it for the first time next year in South African waters, out of Durban, 8th to the 11th of February. Yeah. We're doing a kids' cruise, but 
parents are also welcome. So a family affair. Yeah. So clowns, magicians. We're going to get off at Portuguese Island. We're going to have a treasure hunt. We're going to, it's going to be amazing. And we're doing it with MSC. So the guys can just, you know, go onto MSC's website and book the kids' cruise because we're going to have so much fun. And that's the first time that something like that is going to happen. That's There's always kids on a cruise, but a kid's cruise. <laughs> that sense, the focus is on Turning them. Turning it into a wonderland. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But before that, just before that, you're doing a New Year's event as well. We're doing a New Year's event. I've, I've got a theme that I do super soccy. I've been doing it for about five years now in South Africa. So I do all these events. Uh, I even do a Super Soccer Cruise, which is in March as well, the 8th to 11th of March, yeah. Super Soccer Cruise. But New Year's Eve, Carnival City, we're doing a New Year's Eve Super Soccer Beach Party at Carnival City. So it's going to be transformed. It's going to be amazing. We're doing it outside. We're not at the big top. It's, we've done it for the last three years there. It became too small. We're doing it outside. And we're going to have so much fun. What happens? Like, what happens? Why am I not aware of this? You just come there and you have fun. You know, I've got about eight artists, six, seven, eight artists in the bill, and... It's song after song after song after song. So there's no pauses and there's no uh, people talking in between and things like that. It's just a party. It's a massive music. party. Yeah. Are you a party animal? Uh, I like having a great party. <laughs> I don't think you'll find me four o'clock in the morning uh, after tonight. Is the oat no? Niax need to oat me. No, no, no. Really? No, there's no chance. You're as young as you feel. No, I'm fine. How old do you feel? I feel right now, I feel uh, 25. <laughs> Frozen on 25. And in 12 weeks, we'll talk again. Yes. Yeah. And we'll see, even with the wellness program, with the stronger back. Let's see what happens. Right. So, so uh, you're going to teach me your move. Okay. This is one of your signature moves. Well, it's a move that years and years and years ago, when I was just singing ballads, I came to a festival once, and I'd written a little song called Macy Mason. Yeah. So whenever artists see me now, they say, Kurt's going to do his hip thing. <laughs> it was an accident. I was sitting at a bar stool. There were a whole lot of students in front of us, and I got up and I did this hip thing. I think I thought Elvis made it, <laughs> but I did this hip thing, and everyone just went mad, and they had to give me oxygen. That was crazy. It was fun. All right. So now my friends mock me when I do this. Okay. Okay, so I'm not going to teach you how to socky tonight. That's going to take a little bit, of, a little bit longer. Wait, but wait. Before that, before that, I yeah. do have to sign up, because this might take a while. Yeah. Because I do have two left feet. Okay. Yeah, so it might take a while. Well, Kurt has been fantastic. It's been great having him here in the studio. And welcome back to Johannesburg. And we look forward to all the new music that's coming from this extraordinary South African artist. It's been a grand old time, so be sure to join us again tomorrow for Real Talk. I'm Azania Mustaka. Have a fabulous evening. Good night from me and the team. So, so Kurt, let's get to it. Attitude. Head to the left. Okay. You look at the audience. You give it a old hip. <laughs> she did, did I get it? Me. Did I get it? Well done. All right. So one more time. It wasn't okay. a fluke. So eye. there. In the eye. In the eye. Hip. <laughs> well done. <laughs> no. There you go. All right. So we, here we go. And Sophie's actually like this. Okay. Real Talk is proudly sponsored by Huawei P20 Pro and MTN.